the snail. Why, hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Women Behind Anime and Manga podcast. My name is Valerie, and I'm your host for this podcast, providing you all with little goodies about some incredible women working in these industries. I hope you learn about some new people and are inspired to check out their work. I also hope you're inspired to chase your dreams, shoot for the moon, and succeed in any industry you want to work in. I can't believe I'm on my seventh episode already. I know I was already surprised that I did my fifth and sixth episode, but the seventh is just even crazier to me. I originally had planned to produce seven episodes, and that was kind of it. This podcast did start as a school project, um, but if it's well received, maybe I'll continue? Uh, There are many more people I could cover if you're interested in more, just uh, feel free to comment below and let me know. Last episode, we talked about the animator and director Naoko Yamada, so check that out if you missed it. Uh, Today, we will be going back to the year 24 as we discuss the year 24 group, a group of female manga artists who shaped the shoujo manga genre into what it is today. So without further ado, let's get started. Year 24 refers to a group of multiple female manga artists who essentially created shoujo manga and opened the manga industry to women. Um, Here's a list of the members considered to be part of the Year 24 group. Apologies in advance for butchering any name pronunciations. I'm only human. I'm so sorry. I'm trying my best. Um, So sorry if I also take my time to try to read the names. But anyways, here are the Year 24 group members. First, we have Yasuko Aoike, then there's Moto Hagio, third, we have Ryoko Ikeda, fourth, Toshie Kihara, fifth, Minori Kimura, next, Yumiko Oshima, next, Nanae Sasaya, then there is Keiko Takemiya, Mineko Yamada, and Ryoko Yamagishi. Um, Again, sorry if I butchered any of those names, I tried my best. (laughs) But the name Year 24 itself isn't an official name. They weren't a group of women who worked together as the Year 24 group. Rather, they were just collectively referred to as such when being referenced since all their work emerged at the same time. Some of the members were born in the year 1949, which was also called the Showa 24, or the 24th year of the Showa era, and that's why it became one of the nicknames and although the year became the overall nickname since some of the members were born at this time not every member was born in this year they all just got grouped together since they were all influential and were just a part of the group so here's a quick history lesson of how it all began in the 1950s and 60s shoujo mangas were typically written by men and they all had very passive tones and were generally family drama or romantic comedy themes. And eventually in the 60s, a lot of these men who began writing shoujo series for girls ended up swapping over to write shonen series uh, for a young boy demographic. The shonen genre was starting to take off and so a lot of men started to swap over to that genre to kind of make a career in that side of the industry. And this migration of them, uh, these men writing shoujo to shonen, it was kind of the beginning of female writers coming into the mix. And Year 24 members began their careers and published many of their works in the 70s, um, which was right after everyone started to swap over. And once the Year 24 members began publishing their works at this time, shoujo manga was starting to evolve. Rather than focusing on lighthearted little girl stories based around love and family with very passive, just regular everyday girl characters, now multiple subgenres were starting to appear. Uh, these subgenres included science fiction, historical fiction, uh, adventure, fantasy, horror, and same-sex romance, and this included both boys' love, uh, male and male relationships, and girls' love. Uh, you know, girl-on-girl relationships. And female characters started to have more of an intense backstory, a stronger mindset, and they just had an overall stronger character. They weren't as 
you know, passive, maybe a little bit more feminine. A lot of these characters started to, you know, question gender norms and whatnot. And just a lot of these new subgenres were sort of taboo in a way. Uh, works involving topics such as sexuality, they were very controversial and exploring things like politics and sexuality became a big trait of the Year 24 group and their impact. They were bringing these genres uh, to this demographic and now in the present day a lot of these themes are common and they're not as shocking. I've read a few um, kind of series, I mean obviously a lot of these sho or shoujo series have these genres. I've read an action-based shoujo series like Yona of the Dawn, which I highly recommend. A very strong female character going into battles with a team of dragons? That's all I'll give as a preview. <laughs> um, it's just a really good series. There is a romance in it, but again, there's a lot more action in it, which you typically wouldn't see in a lot of older shoujo series. Um, I've also read a few same-sex uh, shoujo series. I've read Goodbye My Rose Garden, which is a historical fiction series uh, featuring girls' love. And I've also read the series Like Two Peas in a Pod, which is a really cute BL or a boys' love story. I can't confirm if this one is considered to have a shoujo demographic. Um, I tried looking it up, but I couldn't really see it. But since it was an innocent like non 18 plus mature series i'm assuming it was for a shoujo audience rather than a jose or adult women demographic since a lot of uh, bl stories for jose audiences are a little bit more on the 18 plus mature side uh, but yeah those are some series that i've read that kind of showed the impact that a lot of these subgenres created by the year 24 group had um, so, along with like politics and sexuality, another thing they challenged in their work was gender norms. Uh, works were starting to feature female protagonists leading adventures in action, which typically wasn't seen. A lot of these female heroines had very androgynous and boy-like appearances. And an example that I'm thinking of the top of my head is Sailor Uranus and Sailor Moon. Now, I haven't read or watched the series yet, though I'm planning to once I have the time. It is a very long and complicated series, um, but correct me if I'm wrong, but Sailor Uranus is a very androgynous character, and I believe they're actually described as gender fluid, um, but they're still kind of looped in with the rest of the female sailors, and they're also in a same-sex relationship with Sailor Neptune, if I remember correctly. And I always thought they were a couple from a lot of posts that I've seen, but it turns out in the English dub, and like only the English dub, they made the two characters like cousins, which was really weird. But when looking at the original work, um, translations kind of made everything get lost. But through the original work, these characters challenged uh, gender norms and explored different sexualities. And that's kind of just the impact that I'm talking about. Uh, but Sailor Moon wasn't created by a member of the Year 24 group, but I'm just using it as an example of a shoujo uh, girl's work that was able to be created after the influence made by the group. But speaking of work created or not created by the Year 24 group, here's a quick list of series that were written by the group. They are very old, you know. I mean, they're not very old, but they were written in the 70s, so I haven't read any of them myself, but I'd love to check them out, and I hope to do so in the future, so I recommend trying it yourself. Maybe we can read it together, have a quick little discussion. <laughs> um, but here's a quick list. Ryoko Yamagishi wrote, I'm sorry if I butcher this title, but she wrote Shiroi Heia no Futari, which was a manga series that's known for being the first to feature a lesbian couple. And uh, Keiko Takemiya wrote In the Sun Room, which is known for being the first manga to show a male-on-male -male kiss. And Keiko Takemiya also sort of founded the art style of using flowers as a background to kind of show um, like emotion or beauty. And this is, a, I'm sure it's an image you've all seen at least once, kind of thinking about in Oran High School Host Club, every time Tamaki was like reaching out and they had all the flowers in the background. That's kind of the flower iconography that I'm talking about. And this was kind of just like first portrayed in her work before it became a very common 
um, manga layout. And then Moto Hagio wrote They Were Eleven, and this series was actually one of the first of four shoujo mangas to be released in America, which is just wild. Uh, just kind of shows how groundbreaking the work was. And lastly, I'll mention The Star of Cotton Land, written by Yumiko Oshima, which marked the beginning of cat girl characters, <laughs> which is a very well-known and popular character type in some works of fiction. I personally can't think of like a cat girl series that I've read, like a legit one, um, but a lot of fans typically write their own stories featuring cat girls. A lot of people draw them. Uh, but for those of you who don't know what a cat girl is, they're basically like human girls with cat ears and a tail. Very fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, so those are a couple different works by some of the artists and kind of the impact that they had or why they were so important. I highly recommend checking these out and seeing the foundation for today's shoujo manga. But that's all I wanted to cover for today kind of just an introduction to the group, their impact, and a few of their works, kind of the whole layout that I've been doing this whole time. But just thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned something new. Thank you for listening to my podcast if you have. This happened, uh, again, to start it as a school project, but who knows, I may stick around with it. But it's been an incredible, uh, fun experience. So truly from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming with me on this creative journey. If you'd like more, comment below and I'll see what I can post. Uh, but friends, this marks the end of my journey, at least for what I had planned. Uh, if I don't see you again, I hope you have a great day, and I hope you reach for the stars. You can do anything you put your mind to, like we've seen these incredible women do within the anime and manga industries. I hope you have a good one, and thank you again. This is Valerie, signing off.